Welcome to the Esoteric Beat, uh, where uh, you know many people have asked me, "Do you know the secret?" And I'm happy to tell you, beats me. It's uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to have the modern hermeticist Dan Attrell, a uh, great pal of mine, on the show. How's it going, Dan? It's going well. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. So, uh, so Dan has done some really awesome stuff in the uh, the field of uh, of esoteric studies, and uh, I've invited him on today to talk about Marsilio Ficino, who he's been translating as as well as the uh, the great uh, text of medieval astral magic, the Picatrix. Um, so, uh, well, let's start, you know, with what's fresh. You've just uh, gotten finished, if I've understood this correctly, with the uh, Ficino translation. Tell us about it. Yeah, so it's just gone through peer review, and uh, we've got a green light from the University of Toronto Press. So we've just got to get our final edits in to get the page proof set, and then we're good to go. So we should be looking at a publication if we're extremely lucky at the end of 2021, but more likely 2022. And uh, it's it's been a blast to work on. You know, we did it all digitally through Google Docs and Discord, and um, we would meet. So me, my team is with David Preka and Brett Bartlett. We meet about two hours every day and have been since the beginning of the pandemic to churn out texts. And we've been working on some other projects that we've got to keep under wraps until we've got things more finalized. But uh, the Ficino one is the one that's been uh, brought to fruition. So uh, it shines light on a sort of different facet of Ficino, or at least a facet that's not really well known in his in his popular conception, you know, scholars of Ficino, they know that Ficino fairly well as the, as the priest, the Catholic priest Ficino, but uh, not everybody is really up to speed on that because a lot of people get their Ficino narratives from Francis Yates and DP Walker and things like that. So they think of Ficino more as a magician than a priest. And, um, he was kind of all of these things, you know, a priest, physician, magician, um, you know, all of these various disciplines really bled into each other at the time. So that was a big part of uh, Ficino was trying to encapsulate a, a huge array of knowledge. Uh, and we see that in, uh, you know, his platonic theology we see that he was very well versed in in theology and in ancient philosophy and then in in the uh de christiana religione he's familiar with the liter the patristic literature and with um polemical literature like anti-jewish and anti-islamic polemical literature and then in in later works like de vita libri tres we get the physician astrologer side of him um and around this period he was translating as well the works of plotinus and the the neoplatonists iamblichus and so forth and uh he he starts to have more of that in his work so he has a a lot of different facets and this work was from kind of his midlife around when he was 40 years old and becoming a priest so this is the period when he was in the process of becoming a priest, and I, I'm, I'm guessing he, he can be sort of less radical in that. Uh, he has to be a little bit more conservative as, as becoming a priest, would that be right? Yeah, so what I sort of postulate is that he was trying to demonstrate, well, first off, he was trying to marry religion and philosophy. That's his primary goal. He thinks that the scholastics have severed religion from philosophy and now they've become two separate things and he thinks in ancient times in in wiser times uh philosophy and theology were married they were one thing and he sees that in plato in pythagoras in zoroaster in hermes and so forth so he's not so much trying to resurrect paganism, but he's trying to demonstrate that there was this logocentric theology that 
stands outside of time, and it's the theology of the eternal priest doing the eternal sacrifice, and that man is made in the image of this priest doing this sacrifice. And so you get this sort of uh, Neoplatonic cascade of images whereby man sacrifices in his primordial state uh, to the highest principle. And so he, in doing so, he is mimicking the image of God. And so in De Christiana Religione, he's very much trying to marry his Platonism that he got from translating the works of Plato during the 60s and the Corpus Hermeticum as well, as well with things like hymns of, of Proclus and Orphic hymns. And he's uh, trying to make a theology that in, in encompasses the two, uh, but he's demonstrating his good faith in using that theology then against Jews and Muslims. Because he, so a lot of people concentrate on this idea that he is constructing this Prisca Theologia narrative, and he is certainly doing that. But in the second half of the book, which is a lot drier, that's the book that derives from these converso polemicist sources like Jerome of Santa Fe and Paul of Burgos and Ricoldo of Monte Crucis. And these guys were medieval Dominican polemicists, uh, conversos usually, who left Judaism, took up the cloth, and then wrote anti-Jewish polemics using Jewish literature. And I think that Ficino is tapping into that current because those people used their anti-Jewish theological polemics to prove their own good faith. Ficino could use their ideas, nestle them within his platonic synthesis, and then use that to demonstrate his good faith. And it, the work was not super popular. It was more so an attempt to, to inaugurate his future platonic endeavors because he hadn't published any of them. He hadn't published his translations of Plato. He hadn't... Uh, published his Platonic Theology until 84. And then he also translated the De Christiana Religione into Italian uh, very quickly. His sources were in Latin, so he wrote it in Latin, but then it was translated into Italian. And, you know, the intention behind that is to popularize, is to disseminate, is to spread this idea of a Christocentric you know, Platonic synthesis and uh, and make it accessible to people who aren't necessarily schoolmen, and so you could you could slot that into his humanist side as a somebody who's trying to write in in the, the vulgar tongue of the day, which was you know increasingly more and more fashionable during the fifteenth century. But yeah, so I I think that definitely he was trying to use this work to prove his good faith um, as a priest. And somebody, and, and you get all these references in his works where he's saying like, look, I'm no less a Christian than a Platonist. He's always saying, he's always stressing that whatever he does, in as much as he's a Platonist, he's also, he, he's mainly a Christian. And in the De Vita, he says, you know, I prescribe talismans and potions and things like that, but I only do so insofar as it's for the healing properties and for the good. And, uh, and I don't recommend anything that the church is against. And so that's the, that's the kind of a, approach that Ficino has. He explores certain topics, but he always has this discourse of um, subordinating himself to the will of the church, which is, you know, not uncommon. And it especially makes sense uh, as a priest. But uh, by and large, I think that uh, Ficino took up the cloth because his main aim was to unite philosophy and religion. And so he did that in himself. And then in De Vita, we get that fleshed out even more where he becomes this philosopher, priest, physician, magus, kind of all around uh, yeah, Zoroastrian magus type figure who, who is, who's a polymath and does it all. So what does this all say? You know, um, so first of all, let me recap. Um, 
you know, so you're translating uh, on the Christian religion, which Ficino wrote in his 40s, and he's sort of in a midway point in his encounter with the, the Neoplatonic tradition, um, which, as you're saying, it's more of a way of understanding how that tradition sort of um, was in conversation, or, or it was like one of the main sources of Christianity in, in ancient times. And so he's kind of more rediscovering how Christianity and Neoplatonism have a lot, you know, the, it's a similar style of theology, right? Um but so what does this all say about the relationship of religion and, and magic, especially as we're reconsidering this, uh, uh, this view of, of Ficino that, that begins with Ficino the Magus? So, you know, why, why does he then turn to do uh, De Vita? How does, uh, how does magic fit in uh, to religion? So I suppose if it's from the position of Ficino, I guess if we look at the 70s, in his in his life he's not really talking about magic there is no magic at all in de cristiana religione which might you know come as a disappointment to some people but that's just the way the cookie crumbles and he starts to get interested in that stuff i think more so as he discovers the the neoplatonists in more detail because up until the 70s he was the main Neoplatonist he was involved with was Proclus. And of course, this was Proclus through various translators. And, and then, of course, there's also Dionysius the Areopagite, who is the most important. Um, and he puts him upstream. You know, he's not the pseudo Dionysius of the sixth century, he's the, the disciple of Paul, from whom all other Pla later Platonists usurped his doctrine. Um, it's very clear that they, that Ficino thought that they had taken the teachings of Dionysius in order to elucidate the ancient theology, the Prisca Theologia. So I think in, in studying, and Ficino claims, and it's probably not true, that, that it was Pico who on the year or the day rather that, uh, Ficino was publishing his Platonic corpus, his translate, complete translations of Plato, that he encountered Pico, who suggested to him that he should translate Plotinus after that. And so Ficino claims Pico prodded him to translate Plotinus, and then he did so. And then from Plotinus, he got into the later Platonists. And I think, you know, Iamblichus falls in, in under this aegis. And it's in there that he sees the the iamblichan theurgy and he sees oh look this is not this isn't base magic this is like this lofty manipulation of symbols of symbola and um it's an attempt to you know it's theurgy it's god working this isn't conjuration of demons which we see again and again Ficino is is very uneasy with this idea of the magic of goetic magic or any sort of magic that has any sort of intercourse with demons and he is very much into this i guess neoplatonic magic and that has its roots or it was a tradition that today we call the hermetic tradition if we're going to talk about the practical magic side of of the hermetic tradition rather than just the theoretical Corpus Hermeticum style Hermetic texts. And, you know, those works, they didn't really make that distinction between magic and religion and science even. It was one big seamless endeavor to become unified with God through the active intellect uh, to essentially saturate one's intellect with knowledge to the point that the active intellect descends and comes down on the passive human, human intellect and they become one thing. And that is the true goal of the sage is to perfect the intellect and achieve one's perfect nature. And that's done through a fullness of knowledge. So it's a kind of, you know, Ficino, I don't think necessarily believed this, right? Ficino was a Christian. And so there is a Christian reception point of view to this hermetic tradition of perfect nature that both Ficino and Pico talk about not directly but obliquely that the goal of man is felicitas is happiness or this kind of transcendent 
bliss where you cleave to God and join his throne room as a, as a kind of spirit. Um, you don't ever, well, and this is a distinction between Pico and Ficino. Uh, in Ficino, he, he didn't like this uh, Verowin idea that the soul became dissolved in, in the active intellect, that the one, you know, that the soul was essentially annihilated in the one. He preferred this idea that the soul is immortal like God because it's, an, it's a spark of the divine. It's like, it's a, a kind of lesser God in a way. And it goes to be eternally blissful with God, but separate from him. It just like cleaves to God. It doesn't necessarily, and that ties into, you know, Jewish ideas of devakut and, and, and so forth. But in Pico, he was m more interested in that self-annihilation in the one. And that was a kind of blissful kiss of death experience. So that, that's how the prophets get wrapped up to heaven. Uh, they get kissed by God and they exchange breaths and then their souls, their spirits mingle in one breath and, and the prophet is annihilated. And so Ficino and Pico are tapping into these currents um, uh, that are, you know, we're around in the Islamic world and that were, sh you know, shared by the Brethren of Purity. Um, they're a big player in this, the Ikhwan al-Safa. And uh, we, you know, we get Maimonides in Egypt talking about, you know, reacting to, to use the YouTube jargon, uh, some of these ideas that were floating around in Ibn Washia and in um, the Brethren of Purity. Not that those are connected, those are two different things, but both Ibn Washia and the Brethren of Purity get our major sources for the Picatrix. And so the, so the Picatrix, oh, are Let you- Let me stop you here. Um, yep. Before we move on to the Arabic sources, and um, I, I, I'd, I'd just like to pause with Pico for a moment. Um, you know, Pico being the guy that I was obsessed with for years and interested uh, viewers can go watch my uh, or listen to my interview with Dan over on the Modern Hermeticist channel where we talked about Pico um, for quite a bit. I was I was interested in Pico and Pseudo Dionysius. Uh, so I've been, you know, dying to ask you about what you're learning about Ficino's uh, Neoplatonic Book Club. And, and I'm curious about the mechanics of how, you know, these guys were kind of passing these texts back and forth but especially in how the beef arose between Pico and Ficino. And, you know, Pico's this brash young man who wasn't always very, you know, tactful, which is a big feel for me, and uh, kind of offended Ficino at one point. So can you speak to uh, the book club and, and, and the beef? Uh, yeah, so I, I suppose by the book club, you mean the academy, uh, right. or the, the so-called so academy. Um, and I think that that's not a bad, bad way to call it as a book club to type sort of defang the idea of the Platonic Academy. The only problem is that they used the term academy. So they, they actually thought of themselves as LARPing an academy and uh, they use that language. But I think it is, it is more correct to call it something like a book club or an oration club where they write speeches and poetry and stuff for each other and read philosophy and talk about it. And, and um, like a salon. I, I like to call it a salon. And so, you know, where were the Platonic works coming from? Uh, they were coming from Greece and they were coming from the, the fall of Constantinople and the scholars who uh, leading up to that moment were fleeing and settling in Italy, in Florence. We have you know, Manuel Chrysoloris uh, is a big name. Gemistos Plethon is the, the big name when it comes to Plato, because he was lecturing at the Council of uh, Ferrara on the differences between uh, and similarities between Plato and Aristotle. And that became a really big theme of the Renaissance was how to reconcile these, these two thinkers, um, or what even were the problems that arose between Plato and Aristotle. And I, I would say that that's a good place to segue into where Ficino and Pico differed. And that is that Ficino in his, you know, as the master of his book club uh, was, you know, he, he was the discord moderator. 
and he was very distinctly anti-academic in tone. He had very, he was very like hostile to university learning and the various currents that were going about in the university. Pico, on the other hand, was not. Uh, he had been to various universities, Padua, Paris, and so forth. And he had learned from the various Aristotelian giants uh, like uh, Elia del Medigo, uh, for example, one of his, his Jewish Averroist teachers. And uh, so Ficino, yeah, had this hostile anti-academic attitude, whereas Pico thought that that was a, a little bit too much. Uh, he, he liked Ficino's Platonism, but he also thought that Ficino was um, maybe brushing aside some of the more um, pertinent discussions in the academy and not taking them seriously. And so he, what he wanted to do his major project as the Prince of Concord was to marry Aristotle and Plato. And that is specifically, you know, Ficino's Plato with the university's Aristotle. And, uh, you know, being the brash young superstar theologian type guy that Pico was, he challenged Ficino all the time and was happy to to kind of incite some some controversy whereas Ficino's tendency is to paper over or gloss over their differences and even pico could be attacking Ficino, and Ficino could be praising pico around that same time for having a correct error he's he's like you know the universities are overrun with two types of aristotelians the uh, alexandrians and the averroans and but then there are true Aristotelians like Pico della Mirandola who interpret Aristotle correctly. So he would say that in a letter uh, in his, I think, introduction to Plotinus's Aeneids, which is 1492. Um, and, you know, in the same breath, Pico would write a, tra a tra treatise like De Ente et Uno and argue that being and the one are one thing, that they are uh, synonymous, whereas the old school platonic position is that the one is more rarefied than being. Being is lower on the, on the hierarchy of being, if you will, um, than the one, whereas Pico is saying, no, they're, they're the same thing, being and the one. And that's, I think, one of the major points of difference between Pico and Ficino. And it's something that Ficino kind of glosses over. He doesn't take it too seriously. Like he doesn't see these as fundamental differences that necessarily like ruin his whole project. But to Pico, they are. To Pico, he's saying, like, look, you can either be right or you can you can believe what the Neoplatonists believe. Uh, I think it was Brian Copenhaver who said the solution to Pico's problem of resolving Plato and Aristotle is quite Aristotelian. So, and I think that that's true. Um, and now in all this, we haven't even spoken about Kabbalah, which in a way becomes Pico's tool in a sense, in order to reconcile, let's say, apophatic and cataphatic theologies. Um, he can bridge the gap between Platonism and Aristotelianism using Jewish mysticism. And that's because he kind of reconceptualizes it in a way where he can um, then make it say whatever he really wants it to say, as opposed to what the rabbis would have said. But that's an entirely other story. But it, it suffices to say that Kabbalah does play just as an important part as Aristotle and Plato. And, uh, and that Ficino and um, Pico's debates usually are philosophical in nature. Um, they're not really necessarily super personal or, or anything like that. That's a, good, that's a good point to bring up when I call it a, uh, a beef. Um, yeah. uh, you know, and so the last question I want to ask about um, Ficino and, and Pico is, um, 
What about uh, what, what the so-called post-Plotinian uh, Platonism? Uh, you know, I know that Ficino was immersed in Proclus, but but also uh, both Ficino and uh, Pico were debating, you know, the finer points of interpreting Plotinus. Um, and some scholars have, have pointed to the kind of post-Plotinian, you know, in Iamblichus and Proclus, theurgy is necessary because unlike in Plotinus, where you, you always have this undescended self, this undescended soul aspect of yourself sort of up in the heavens, uh, for Iamblichus and Proclus, if I've got this correct, there's a kind of a disconnect. And uh, so you need theurgy to sort of like reestablish this, this link with the gods. Um, where is uh, uh, the Ficino and, and Pico debate vis-a-vis -vis, um, these questions of, of theurgy and, and Neoplatonism and the difference between Plotinus and, and the later Neoplatonists? So I will give a caveat that I haven't studied in depth uh, the recent because a, a lot of the stuff I've been looking at was in, in the 1470s, whereas this stuff is more in the 1490s. Um, but that said, I, I, I can... I'm pretty sure that the answer to this is that for Ficino, it is the theurgy. The theurgy is important as in the sacraments. It's the sacraments that do the God working. And so he was, you know, the kind of priest that did the mass, did he performed the sacraments. And um, in doing so, he, you know, made the presence of Christ real. And that is um, to him... I think uh, restoring the bridge between humanity uh, and God, because in Neoplatonism, you're not fallen. You're just like this pendulous elastic band that has been stretched from your, your primordial station. But in Christianity, that band has been broken and, um, and only Christ can bridge the gap between you and your your soul's highest state. And so I think that one of the mediating, mediating factors in that is the, uh, you know, communion is, is the, the sacraments of the wine and the bread and the mass and all the other sacraments. <laughs> so so what about I in think, Pico, though? You know, I, people talk about Pico as being into this intellectual ascent, right? Does does he find the sacraments as necessary, or does he think you can just do it by doing tableau and philosophizing? Does he have a kind of a different theurgical take? I think his take is more um, what we would call poetic, and more uh, more of this love uh, uh, erotic. So again, Ficino priest. He's not using these metaphors of eros. Pico, uh, being a layman and being more interested in his youth in in poetry and you know courtly love and things like that, uh, he was more interested in in the kabbalistic language of Maimonides. Um, you know, he thought Maimonides was a kabbalist, which he wasn't. But um, well, reading Abulafia, you might get that impression. Yes, exactly. Um, and so, you know, there's this whole tradition of reading the song, uh, the song of songs and the, the love poetry, uh, and that's in the Bible and Pico reads that as this, um, uh, you know, we, we talked about it earlier, this erotic kiss of death that, that eviscerates the body and the soul, um, and returns the soul back to dissolution into the one. And so I think that, yeah, Pico was more following this mentalist model um, of, of poetic or uh, erotic madness um, and, and falling into a kind of ecstatic state through Kabbalah, because he says, you know, there are two kinds of Kabbalah. There's the, the practical Kabbalah, which he, like Abu Lafia, said, involved the sephirot and then there's the speculativus kabbalah and that's the visionary kabbalah and that involves the divine names and so in his mind you can use the divine names in order to allow the intersexual dynamics of god to operate uh, because he's envisioning this essentially triad of triads that you climb back up 
and man is a kind of tetractus. Um, and he's trying to dissolve himself back into the oneness of God. And so, yeah, I think that Pico's uh, approach was far more speculative than theurgical or, or was more like, um, mental, if you want to call it that. I don't know if I, that's a good idea. That seems like a modern way of thinking about it because they, they didn't think about it as that. But yeah, I think that that, that might be the difference was that Ficino would be more theurgical in his approach, uh, being a priest and Pico less so. And then there's the whole question of astrology, right? Which is that Ficino accepts astrology but with some reservations and then and then pico just hates it outright <laughs> and right so thinks every aspect of it is crap and you know one of the things that you've really helped me to appreciate about magic and the the tradition of uh, the picatrix which we're going to turn to look at um so we're rewinding the clock a few centuries to get into um islamic magic um is um so so why you know why do we need to um to look back toward um the brethren of purity these philosophical movements in um in the islamic world and 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 the magic of the picatrix how does that help um to explain or, or uh, you know flesh out the uh, the relationship of magic and theology and these guys and, and i'm thinking also you know you really helped me to appreciate that this is an astral magic right in the picatrix it's it's all about astrology so you know what happens between um between them uh, and pico to get pico thinking of magic and in, in such an anti-astrological way Right. So probably the best place to start thinking about this is just the title of the Picatrix in the Arabic. It is the goal of the sage, uh, the Qayyat al-Hakim. And so what is the goal of the sage? And this was a question that was heavily debated uh, by all manner of philosophers uh, going back to antiquity. You get it in Iamblichus, in the closing of, of his book, you know, he's talking about what is true success. What is eudaimonia? What is this? What is the final highest aspiration of mankind? And for the people who assembled the Picatrix, the highest aspiration of mankind is to know God. But God is everything. Like, and so in order to know God, you must know everything. And then you become one with that overarching intellect that it's, and you know, they use the language of spheres and circles in order to expand one's mind and grow the sphere of their awareness into the sphere of the active intellect. So that was one approach. And that was the approach that, that the uh, Islamic scientists took. And it makes sense that they would take that approach because they don't have the competing model, which is this Christological, uh, theurgical, pseudo-Dionysian model, which creates the third crust over top of the celestial world in the Christian world. And so Pico della Mirandola and Marsilio Ficino, they're, you know, they think astrology is cool and all right, it's all, it's okay. But it's, it's subordinate to the super celestial world of the angels and the divine names. And that's where all the true magic happens. And that we don't even call it magic anymore. We just call it theology. You know, Pico says the true theology turns people into Metatron. And so they become the active intellect. Now in Picatrix, they don't, they didn't have this whole angelic hierarchy uh, jesus and the holy spirit business they're operating within an islamic and um, aristotelian and platonic context and so the highest aspiration for them is to make your mind one with the greatest mind and what happens when you do that what is the outcome of that well in the Christian world, it's salvation, right? It's just you go to be one with God. But in the magical worldview, it's the ability to do magic. And so, um, for example, in 
Petrus Alfonsi's Disciplina Clericalis, you know, he was a converted Jew who knew all kinds of philosophical matters. And he said that there was a debate in his day and age in the 10th century, or the 11th century rather, as to what is the seventh liberal art? What is the very highest and last liberal art? And in his mind, it boiled down to various parties arguing different things. And some people argued that it was philosophy was the highest of the liberal arts. And that was the, the, the goal of the sage was to become a, a perfect philosopher. And then the other um, school of thought was grammar. It was to become, which is the fir- one of the first liberal arts, right? But apparently it's also the highest one. So I suppose this would be like the sophist's answer, that, that language constructs reality and that everything is subordinate to language. And then uh, the third answer, he says, there are some more wicked people who would say that nigromancia, and that's astral magic, is the highest achievable goal for man. That's the, the sum of all the liberal arts. And that very much is the view that was espoused uh, in the Picatrix and spread out through Spain in the 13th century, for example, that that you could uh, basically become a, a complete and full human being through the activation of your magical powers, through the actualization of the perfect nature, which is achieved through learning and through ritual. And so I think that that's kind of how those things tie together is that later in the Renaissance, there become competing modes. I wouldn't even say later in the Renaissance, I would say starting in the 13th century, there are competing modes of thinking about what is the highest aspiration for mankind. And uh, in the Christian world, of course, anybody dealing with talismans or whatever, what they're doing is they're being tricked by demons to do things that allow them to come into this world. So the demon will come and say like, oh, I'll do such and such a thing for you if you manipulate this golden token and recite this special word and create this special smell, then the demon can come into this world and they've fooled the magician. And you, you, you can see going back to Augustine, you know, in Augustine City of God talking about demonology, he's criticizing this stuff. So there's a real rich tradition of people like Augustine blasting against the magic that you see in something like the PGM. That gets carried through to the Middle Ages with the universities in Paris, where you have guys like Bishop Tempier or, or the Speculum Astronomiae, where they're talking about how there are uh, different kinds of magic. There are de- demonic, and then there is natural magic, and that creates that fork between um, what is purely, let's say, in our modern parlance, scientific, and then what is uh, done through the influence of demons. So the the Christian view in the Renaissance is that all of the stuff that's done in the Picatrix is this demonic stuff, but there are certain things in that book that can be extracted that are purely medicinal or natural. And that's what Ficino does in De Vita. And it's, he doesn't mention the Picatrix by name, but he mentions it in a letter to his cousin, Filippo Valori, uh, that everything that was a value in the Picatrix, he extracted it and put it into his De Vita. So that's, that's how he thought of the work. And, and so it's really difficult to talk about the influence of the Picatrix on the Renaissance because people are always expecting you to talk about how one thing was like used, but, and so that's, that happened. There are some use cases in the, in the materia medica and things like that. But more importantly, there are these theoretical, these uh, theological reactionary currents where people are reacting to the idea of what constitutes a perfect sage. What is the, the highest aspiration of man? And so I think when I, When I look at a document like the Oratio, the so-called Oration on the Dignity of Man by Pico, we get this story about how man can 
uh, ascend to be with the angelic intellects and annihilate himself in God. And that is basically um, what man's dignity is, if anything. <laughs> so it's interesting to uh, tease out these connections. And one of the explicit links is Yohanan Alamano, who is Pico's teacher um, in Hebrew. And he was explicitly interested in merging Kabbalah and astral magic. And so he has all these passages dealing with the Sephirot and the, uh, the planets in parallel almost, but the planets are at a lower level. So it's very clear that, you know, the planets act on a lower octave than the, than the Sephirot do. And, um, you, he, the way he talks about talismans or rather, um, the Torah, the way he talks about doing mitzvot, uh, it's very reminiscent of the language of magical talismans. And it uses the, the language of, of, you know, force operating across these various levels of the divine hierarchy. And, so I think Pico in encountering that stuff in Yohanan Alamano writes against it in the Heptiplus and in the, in the Disputationes contra Astrologiam Divinatricem, the, uh, those are his, uh, anti-astrological disputations. So yeah, it's a very oblique and torturous path, but there are definitely like connections from the the that magical worldview to the theological worldview of the Renaissance. They are they are interconnected in many ways that I think have been underappreciated, but they're they're there.